Do you all know that approximately three billion phone calls are made in the United States every single day? And out of those three billion phone calls, approximately six billion text messages are shared throughout the United States on average. But I have to point out that teenagers text approximately 3,300 times per month. And I'm sure that has a great contribution to the text messaging that we see in the billions. Now, I share that information not because I'm a statistician, not because mathematics was my favorite subject, but I share that information, one, because I'm a police officer and technology has had a valuable uh, insight to policing. But I also share that information because I'm a father and my son is a teenager. And so, if you're a cop, you know how important technology has been throughout the ages. I've been a police officer since 2003, and I remember when I went to the quartermaster, which my son would not know about today, the quartermaster gave me a pager. And that pager was a way to communicate with the police department. It was the way to look at messaging through the police department. And ultimately, that's all you had. And I remember listening to more senior officers, and they talked about all they really had uh, was a, a car and a radio inside their vehicle. And any information that was transcribed, that's how they received that information. And so later in my career, I really began to understand the value that the cell phone had for me. As I became a supervisor, it gave me the ability to have notifications and send them streamlined. It gave me the ability to not only get notifications, but it also gave me the opportunity to look at my emails and respond very quickly. And so maybe for some of you, uh, you leave the house and you make a U-turn to go back and get your cell phone because we hold on to it so greatly. And outside of it being a cell phone, uh, maybe, you, maybe you've gotten a lot of phone calls from family members while you were at work. And the phone calls normally start out like this, or the text messages normally start out like this. Hey, Tarek, I'm, I'm, at work, I'm, I'm at work today, and I'm about to leave. Can you tell me where officers are shooting radar or laser at? Or maybe you get the question, I just got pulled over by the police, and at this point in time, I think they're going to write me a citation. Do you know anyone that's on duty? Or, or can you talk to them for me to help me get out this citation? And normally your answer is no. Uh, but for most managers and for most police officers, I think one of the funniest things that we use a cell phone for is to say, hey, where are we going to eat lunch at today? But outside of that, the reason why I acknowledge that teenagers using cell phones is because I have a teenage son. And he stays in Oklahoma. And his name is Isaiah. And normally when I call Isaiah, he does not answer his cell phone. Normally he sends me a text back. And I'm like, I'm the parent. You're, you're the son. You're, you're not my parent. I'm your father. I need you to answer your cell phone. And sometimes, I believe he's not trying to be disrespectful. He's, Dad, I just got out of practice. I'm, I'm trying to relax a little bit. September 16th, my son called me. And for me... It was very ironic that he called me because, as parents, you know your children's behavior. And I called him back, and I said, hey, what, is everything okay? Because normally you text me. You normally don't answer your phone. And when I got on the phone with him, I could immediately tell that it was something wrong with him. And I said, son, is, is everything okay? Are, are you doing all right? What, what, what's the problem? I could hear the sadness in his voice. I could hear the complexity of how he was feeling. And I found myself being a thousand miles away and what he was going through, I was not there to touch my son. And he began to express to me, he said, Dad, did you see it? I said, what, what is it? He said, did, did you see the television? I said, yeah, I've been watching television. What exactly are you talking about? He said, Dad, he had his hands up. He said, this, this is one where they actually had their hands up. And he said, he's not a big, bad guy. 
He said, I just saw him in church this past Sunday, and he told me how proud he was of me. And he said, I don't, I don't understand why he was shot. He said, I'm, I'm trying to understand this. I'm trying to really process this information. And at that point in time, I began to talk to my son, and I began to, to express to him why police officers make the decisions that they make. Not to rush to judgment and understanding case law regarding Graham versus Connor and talking with him through all those points. And at the same time, listening to his mother sob in the background. September the 16th, Terrence Crutcher was shot in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Terrence Crutcher went to the church of my son. My son's grandfather is the pastor of that church. And I, I want to bag back for a second because if you're a father, you understand the importance of having a relationship with your son. This is my firstborn son. I was there for him when he was born. I remember holding him, cradling him in my arms when he was born. I remember uh, as a young man going to football practices with him. And this is the kid that has never been in trouble with law enforcement. This is the kid that answers yes, sir, no, sir. This is a kid that's not disrespectful to adults. And my son had just shared with me the previous summer. He said, Dad, I'm getting older now, and I'm really going to need to talk to you about some things going into my teenage years. And we normally sit down and we normally discuss issues concerning policing, and we normally discuss issues concerning just being a young man and with the, with the goal to be successful in life. This is the kid that impresses his dad at times, and he puts up on his Facebook page a picture of me playing football at Oklahoma State saying, I just want to be just like him when I grow up. So I want you to understand the importance of, of the relationship that I have with my son. And at this point in time, I'm finding myself sitting in an apartment in Washington, D.C., thousands of miles away from him, and really what he's expressing to me, Dad, I need you here, and I need you to really express and understand, and understand what I'm going through. And it's not what the conversation was about, but it's what my son said to me right before we hung the phone up. He asked me a question. He said, Dad, am I safe? He said, Dad, am I safe? And at that moment, I paused because as a father, as a protector, I felt like I could not protect my son at that particular time. I've been in policing for 14 years now. As a supervisor, I responded to many deadly force situations, and I understand the dynamics that go along with law enforcement shootings. But at that particular time, I felt like I was insecure. I felt like I was not there for him in that moment, and I feel like I failed him. And I felt like having the great opportunity to serve as a law enforcement fellow at the International Association of Chiefs of Police for the last year, I've had the opportunity to travel around the country. And I've had the opportunity to talk to people that do not like the police. And I've listened to their stories. I've been in multiple political environments. I've listened to many parents that said, my son has been killed by the police. And not understanding the circumstances surrounding it, I've been very empathetic to their situations. I've listened to many African-American parents talk about their fear of dealing with the police and their children not coming home. And so at this particular time, I began to look at all of these emotions that I had inside of me, and here I am sitting there talking to my son on the phone. And I found myself having the conversation with him that many African-American parents are focused on having with their young men right now, which they've identified as the talk. And that talk starts something like this. When you get pulled over by the police, what you immediately need to do is put your hands on the steering wheel. Don't look at the officer. Ensure that you do everything that the officer directs you to do. Ensure that you comply with every direction that the officer tells you to do. And only make eye contact with the officer if they ask you a question. And if you should happen to reach over to the glove box, if you should happen to need to get your insurance, Make sure you do it slowly as you reach over. And I found myself having this conversation with my son. If the police ask you to stop, you need to stop and comply. And if they do anything wrong, then we'll address it later. 
I've learned to understand how many people are fearful of the uniform. And this is why community police relations has become such a passion to me. And as we look at the scope of the issues that are going on within our country, we know that law enforcement do a great job every single day of serving communities. Everyone cannot do this job. And as you sit in here today and the walls capture the presence of you, know that everyone in here has a calling upon their life, a calling to do best, the best that they possibly can, a calling to do the best for the profession, to be progressive and moving forward. But I also realize that there's an adamant fear in communities of color when it comes to police. And so I had to ask myself, why, why are we having these issues? And ultimately, I've come to realize is that it's not because of the cops that are good. It's because, really, we have different lenses that we look at these situations in. People in communities of color, people that are in neighborhoods that are disenfranchised, really, they're looking at policing in a historical lens. They're not looking at policing for what it is today, but they're looking at policing for what it has been and ultimately what they still see remnants of it today. So please allow me to explain. If you understand the history of policing in the United States of America, you will really look at informal policing processes at the point of slavery. When slaves were originally brought to our country and they were placed on plantations and they were there to work for profit, for whomever their slave master was. And when those slaves would leave to escape, then those that were employed to police the property were to go get the slaves, arrest them, and beat them, and bring them back. It was estimated that during slavery and the Civil Rights Movement that over 4,000 African Americans were lynched in this country. And it's also alleged that as they hung and as they burned, that many of them were handcuffed behind their back. And so as we look at the civil rights movement, we look at the role of law enforcement when it came to the civil rights movement and we understand that police really uh, used excessive force, did not protect the constitutional rights of citizens. And here most recently, we've seen video on television where an African-American male was handcuffed on the ground and an officer immediately gets out of his vehicle and runs up and begins to kick the gentleman in the head. That's what people are afraid of. That's what people are concerned about. But ultimately, I cannot stand here and omit that it takes courage to wear the badge, that it takes courage to work in this profession. And we have to acknowledge the acts and the works that police do every single day to protect our communities. There are over 18,000 law enforcement agencies in the United States of America. Out of 18,000 law enforcement agencies, there are approximately 900,000 plus police officers who get up every single day, regardless of the atmosphere in politics, regardless of the atmosphere in their communities, and they go out every single day and service their communities. And we cannot omit the fact that when some of you took the oath, that you did not know that policing would look like what it's looking like today. But as a mentor shared with me here recently, I would submit that this is the greatest time to be a police officer in the United States. Because what we do is lead and we solve problems. But I cannot ignore the fact that the public has put so much on law enforcement. They expect us to deal with mental illness. They expect us to deal with de-escalation training. They expect us to understand procedural justice. And while all these things are valuable, and while we're doing them, Sometimes we don't get the acknowledgement that we need behind what we're doing and why we're doing it. Police officers are asked to be mentors. Police officers are asked to fill in the parents. Police officers are asked to respond to mental illness calls and deal with situations that people normally don't want to deal with. And every now and then, the load gets heavy. I remember sitting in my apartment, watching television, and across the screen flashes my home city. I was born and raised in Dallas, Texas. I'm very passionate about where I come from. And as I sat there and I watched the protests and I watched people exercising their amendment rights to really talk about the injustices that we've seen with throughout our country, 
Next thing I know, I see the crowd running. And then next thing I know that they were saying there were two snipers shooting in Dallas. And ultimately, it ended up being one sniper. And I remember texting one of my friends, Officer Cassie Dotsie, that works for the Dallas Police Department. And I asked her, I said, hey, are you okay? And she texted me back. And she said, I'm alive. She said, I just need to finish my shift. And I thought, how selfless was that? In the midst of the chaos that was going on, her goal was to stay committed to defending the people that were protesting that city and ensuring that the city was safe. And so I asked myself, really, how, how have we got to this point in American society? How has activism, how has expression really ended up in hashtags? So over time, we've seen hashtag Black Lives Matter. People from communities of color expressing that, that they don't have the same access to police services. They don't feel like that they're being treated the same. And there are absolutely uh, examples where it brings credibility to that. And then we move from Black Lives Matter to Blue Lives Matter. And really, that conversation was behind officers feeling unappreciated, not acknowledging that police officers go out here and they protect and serve every single day. And then we transition from Blue Lives Matter to All Lives Matter. People that were acknowledging that if someone dies, no life is greater than the other. And ultimately, I believe in American society, sometimes we've de defined ourselves by hashtags. And so we're looking for answers. We're looking for answers in our trauma. We're looking to understand the issues that are going on within our society. And so I would like to tell you today, I don't have all the answers. But let me offer this. Let me leave you with this about community police relations. I'd like to leave you with four points. The first point is that we need to listen, not to validate, but we need to listen to understand. This is a very challenging dialogue. In policing, we're normally used to going into a community meeting, expressing why we do what we do, because we really want to, the public to understand every single thing that we do. But my experiences have been, if we're able to sit down at the table, although that we have differences, we'll learn a lot more than what we actually know. I was able to speak with uh, Chief Lou Degmar the other day about what he was doing in LaGrange, Georgia. And I called him, if anyone is familiar with the story, there was a gentleman by the name of Austin Calloway. Austin Calloway in the 1940s was arrested on an alleged crime in LaGrange, Georgia. He was taken to the police station and he was jailed. And after he was jailed, Hooded men later entered the police station, removed him, and killed him. The police department never did a report. It was never acknowledged publicly. And 77 years later, he found out that this was still impairing his community police relations within his community. And I salute Chief Degmar for doing this. He, he began to talk to faith-based leaders in his community. He began to talk to other people that were a part of his community. And he had a service. And he apologized to his community for the failures of his police department. Not because he was serving during that time, but he understood the impairment that it was still creating on their community police relations. The second thing I would offer up is to refocus on community policing. Also expand your youth programs. As I've traveled around the country, some of the most fearful people that I know that are of the police are young people. And their comments are saying that the cops don't never talk to me and I don't want to talk to them. And they're bound by their experiences that they've had with law enforcement. And not only are they bound by those experiences, they're bound by what their parents have taught them generationally. And so I think it's very valuable that we invest in our youth. The third thing that I would say to, to police and community, we have more similarities than we have differences. Rest assured, police officers are fathers, police officers are mothers. Police officers are sisters, they're brothers, they're sons, they're daughters. And at the end of the day, they want the same respect that the community wants. And the fourth thing I will tell you is that in the midst of all of this, ensure that you take care of yourself. 
Ensure that you take care of yourself. Sometimes we're so worried about boggled down with the issues that we face at work. Sometimes we're so worried about pleasing this person, that person. But the main thing I will submit, the more healthy we are, the more better that we are, the better we can take care of ourselves. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. said, if a man has not found something that he's willing to die for, then he isn't fit to live. And it's my belief that Dr. King was not talking about death. It's my belief that he was talking about the intersection of human will and human sacrifice. And so I will tell you today that I will continue to fight for the badge. I will continue to fight for my community. I will continue to fight for my children. As a man, I'm an American police officer. My name is Tarek McGuire. I'm a lieutenant with the Arlington, Texas Police Department. I'm a kid from an area called Oak Cliff, and I thank you for your time today.